Okay. Thank you all for joining uh, the Young Investigator Lunch. Um, we are going to hear some fantastic talks, and we're really, really proud to sponsor um, these young investigators and um, honor their, the, the hard work that they're doing. Uh, this session is sponsored by Verisonics, and so we're going to hear from Don from Verisonics before we get started. All right, thanks very much. All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Don Christopher. I'm Vice President of Engineering at Verisonics. Uh, first, I'd like to thank the Focus Ultrasound Foundation for holding this symposium. I've worked in two Focus Ultrasound companies in the past decade, so I understand the pain you go through with patient studies and just getting things done, but I'm happy to see the progress in the field. Uh, more importantly for this meeting, uh, Verisonics' employees are very honored to uh, support the uh, Young Investigators Award luncheon and congratulate all the recipients, all 20 of them. And uh, finally, when Ron Daigle founded Verisonics 21 years ago, his goal was to produce the most advanced, flexible ultrasound research platform in the world. He's actually achieved that, but we continue to push the boundaries of what uh, technology can do. So if you have any needs from us and technology, just come find us. Uh, we're here to support you. So thanks very much, and once again, congratulations. And now our first presenter. Hi everyone, I'm Ali Basir, a research fellow in the Department of Radiology at UCLA. I would like to present our study, which is assessment of transuretral ultrasound ablation of prostate using the MR thermometry parameter and clinical response at four years of follow-up. MR-guided transuretral ablation of prostate is a minimally invasive procedure that uh, transit therapeutic ultrasound through urethra and leads to ablation of the prostate tissue. High intensity ultrasound delivered through a blade inside the urethra. The whole procedure is monitored by MR thermometry. And also there is a, a cooling system in urethra and the rectum to prevent any damage to adjacent organs. We use T2 and diffusion images to plan this procedure. We also use MR thermometry to monitor thermal dose delivered through this procedure. There is an automated thermal modulation that controls the uh, the rotation rate, output power, and also fre frequency according to MR thermometry. Uh, before jumping into our study, let's briefly talk about a study that's uh, done before uh, that's called TAC, Tulsa Pro Ablation Clinical Trial. In this study, 100 men with MI with a mild to intermediate prostate cancer were treated using Tulsa in 30 center. One of them were UCLA. And uh, this study show efficacy and safety of, safety of this procedure. In our study, we evaluated a cohort of TAC study consisting of patients who treated at our institution clinical and MR thermometry parameter were evaluated during four years of follow-up and inclusion and exclusion criteria were exactly same as TAC study. Clinical parameter were PSA and prostate biopsy. MR thermometry parameter were cumulative maximum temperature or Tmax and also uh, thermal dose cumulative equivalent uh, minutes at 43 degrees Celsius. TMX and thermal dose were evaluated in whole prostate in addition to transitional zone and peripheral zone. This zone is according to PIRAT 2.1. We also evaluated a, a preretral volume with radius of 2.5 millimeter to evaluate any overtreats 
uh, meant uh, around the uretra, and, and it defined by any T max more than 86 degrees Celsius. At the baseline, uh, we have nine patients with 17 lesion, and uh, at the, fortunately, at 12 month biopsy, we had eight patients without any malignant lesion, and only one patient had two malignant lesions. When we evaluated the PSA, a market or prostate cancer, it decreased significantly from 7 to 0.7 during one month post Tulsa, and it remained low during four years of follow-up. Uh, in this uh, image, you can see the MRI image, MR thermometry according to maximum temperature and thermal dose, and how we uh, separate the, the, uh, the zone of prostate uh, according to the PIRA 2.1. Uh, the median thermal uh, maximum temperature in the whole prostate was 66 degrees Celsius, and according to uh, uh, adequate TMX, which is TMX more than 55 degrees Celsius, 81% of the prostate received adequate treatment, and this amount for the uh, thermal dose, uh, which uh, adequate thermal dose, which is more than 240, same 43 was 95 percent. We also, uh, as I mentioned, we also evaluated the MR thermometry uh, on two zone of prostate. That's there are main zone of prostate actually transitional zone that is near the urethra and peripheral zone. Uh, median TMX in the transitional zone was, seven, uh, was 72 degrees Celsius uh, in comparison with 64 degrees Celsius in peripheral zone. And also a median of the 7.8% of the transitional zone received adequate treatment according to TMX. Uh, this amount was 60% uh, for the peripheral zone. Also, in evaluation of the adequately treatment area, based off the thermal dose, we found that 1.5% of the transitional zone and 3.8% of the peripheral zone received inadequate heating according to thermal zone. And uh, I mentioned that we evaluated an area of two point, and a volume uh, in area of 2.5 millimeter around the urethra. And we found that the median Tmax in this area was 72 degrees Celsius and only 1.5% of this area received TMX of more than 86%. In this slide, you can see MRI image and thermometry for that patient who didn't re respond to our treatment. But the main point here, if you see uh, the section E1 on this image, there is a um, red arrow that shows calcification. And if you match that area on the E2 that shows thermometry, there is an inadequate heated area according to Max beside that. Actually, calcification uh, play a role as a mirror, and it doesn't let the uh, ultrasound wave past this area. We should consider in future that calcification um, is a big problem for treatment of transurethral ultrasound ablation. Uh, in conclusion, MRI guided Tulsa resulted in significant decrease in PSA 
as well as adequate treatment coverage in the whole prostate. In uh, evaluation of MR, th MR thermometry in patients with low to intermediate prostate cancer. Also, in evaluation of MR, uh, MR thermometry of the prostate, we found that TMAX, according to TMAX more than 55 degree and thermal dose more than 240, there is a majority of prostate tissue was covered and treated. Uh, in addition, if we consider the zone, uh, there was a good coverage in that area too. But the point is, uh, I, should, uh, I should bring a point here that transitional zone is near the urethra. And so it's, uh, it will absorb more energy from the peripheral zone and the main point that we have a good coverage in transitional zone is proximity to the transducer. Ultimately, the relation of treatment day energy deposition with clinical outcome can help us to better optimize this procedure. Finally, I would like to uh, thank my mentor, Dr. Raymond, in radiology UCLA and UCLA IDX. I would like to thank Focus Ultrasound Foundation for this opportunity to me to present our work at UCLA. And also, I would like to thank Profond for collaboration with us during this project. If you are interested, uh, in uh, the treatment and detection of uh, abdominal cancer using the ultrasound, please uh, take advantage of this QR code and follow us on Twitter. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ali. Sorry, wow, that's really loud. Um, next we have Ricardo Chioca. Hi, uh, thanks everybody for being here. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, non-invasive uh, biomarker of, of microbubble distribution in the, in the brain and going to compare intraoperative chills with DSC, which is a perfusion MRI. So, um, in our center, we have a vast experience with uh, uh, the use of uh, intraoperative uh, ultrasound, uh, and one of the many um, functions available to us is the CHEUS, or Contrast Enhanced Ultrasound. Um, Contrast Enhanced Ultrasound, um, it's a, it's a real-time non-invasive uh, uh, imaging uh, which required uh, microbubbles as contrast agents. So uh, we were able to observe that different brain structure and uh, lesion have different concentration of uh, microbubbles. And recently also we were able to uh, perform a quantitative analysis of uh, CHEUS, uh, which provided us with uh, many uh, information about uh, the distribution of microbubbles in the uh, brain and lesion. So since uh, microbubbles are uh, intravascular agent, uh, we wanted to um, see if we could um, obtain a correlation between their distribution with uh, another um, uh, technique, um, non-invasive, like the DSC MRI. And so we wanted to uh, perform a qualitative uh, uh, analysis and then a quantitative analysis between the parameters uh, obtained from that. So we enrolled 29 patients with uh, uh, different brain tumors, uh, primarily gliomas and uh, meningiomas, 
the patient were divided into two groups. The temp first, ten patients received a qualitative evaluation between uh, the preoperative uh, volumetric DSC and the um, uh, CHEUS, and the remaining uh, received a quantitative evaluation, uh, but uh, six cases were, were excluded from various results. So we performed a, um, um, an MRI acquisition within two weeks of uh, surgery. Then uh, the day of the operation, uh, after the craniotomy, we used an ultrasound machine coupled with uh, a magnetic track tracking system, which allow us uh, for fusion of the, uh, the two modalities uh, and uh, for virtual navigation. And then we performed a chaos acquisition with uh, um, the injection of uh, microbubbles. So we were able to um, observe that the signal intensity uh, regarding the distribution of uh, microbubbles was uh, um, superimposable with the um, distribution of gadolinium in uh, um, key structure and also in uh, uh, lesion. In this case, uh, on the right, uh, we have a glioblastoma, uh, which has a necrotic central core, so anechoic and so no perfused. And as you can see on the uh, right side, on, on the right, on the left side of the peripheral ring, it's more perfused than the right side. Um, this is uh, another case of uh, glioblastoma. Uh, um, as you can see, the microbubble arrive in the arteries, then on the parenchymal of the tumor, and uh, you can see that uh, in the same uh, coplanar. Um, slice, they are uh, superimposable, their distribution. So then we uh, performed a quantitative evaluation. Uh, we drew some uh, ROIs on the structures, and uh, um, the software provided us the tick, the time intensity curve, and we obtained the parameters from that. In particular, the uh, AUC uh, from the CHEUS, uh, which was compared with the um, relative uh, cerebral volume from the, um, the DDSC. And um, so we performed a correlation analysis and uh, we observed a correlation between uh, these parameters. We weren't able to observe a correlation between uh, the mean transit time and the time to peak, uh, probably because of different um, kinetics of the uh, two uh, uh, contrast agent, so uh, the gadolinium and the microbubbles. So since uh, um, since the, the the possibility to predict the distribution of microbubbles is really important, we uh, wanted uh, to see that, and we think that uh, uh, CBV could be used as. Um, could be used as a non-invasive uh, biomarker to predict their distribution, and uh, in particular to optimize the planning uh, um, of uh, MRG first treatment. Um, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thank you, Ricardo. Uh, up next is Yu Tong Guo. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Yu Tong from Georgia Tech. Um, well, waiting for my slides, but today I'm just going to show you um, some of our data that shows uh, microbubble property and focused ultrasound frequency can be used to modulate blood brain barrier phenotype. Okay. Um, so as we know that microbubble uh, with ultrasound can provide the, the physical method to transiently open the blood-brain barrier and improve the drug delivery in the brain. Um, when the microbubble is interact with the ultrasound field, it acts as a mechanical oscillator and it creates different forces including oscillatory force, radiation force, and uh, indirect shear forces. And it's hypothesized that um, the increase in the permeability is related to these forces. However, the problem is there's a limited consensus on how microbubble property and the ultrasound frequency um, contribute to their interaction and how the, um, the potential resonance effect 
plays a role in their interaction with the vessel wall. So um, to bridge this knowledge gap, we firstly build a mathematical model um, that simulates the microbubble dynamics uh, with, the, with their interaction of the surrounding fluid and also in um, the, the vessel and the uh, surrounding tissue. And using this model, we study the range of system parameters, and uh, the hypothesis generated from this model is tested in vivo. Using, uh, and also we're using a monodispersed microbubble to, um, um, to do for this experiment. Um, so firstly, we would like to assess the effect of microbubble shell property on the blood-brain barrier permeability. Um, to do this, we uh, firstly modeled two uh, type of dif uh, different microbubble, um, Optisan and Dafinity. Dafinity has um, a lipid shell, which is considered more elastic compared to the Optisan microbubble, which, is, um, which has the albumin shell. And what we found from, from our model is that the affinity bubble, which have a lipid shell, um, more elastic, have um, stronger oscillation compared to optical microbubble. And then to test this hypothesis, we did an in vivo experiment to follow this protocol and using um, the affinity and optical bubble of the same size and inject the uh, same number of total number of microbubble. Our experiment shows that the affinity bubble have a stronger oscillation compared to uh, optics and micro bubble. And this leads to an increase in the vessel permeability. And then to further consolidate this funding, we also assess a tight junction protein, which is considered as the key component of the, um, uh, the blood brain barrier. And what we found is that the affinity bubble, which has a more elastic shell, uh, has a significant downregulation of this tight junction protein, and to get, which shows that uh, the microbubble with more elastic shells uh, are more potent in opening the blood-brain barrier and increase the permeability. And then um, what makes our data more interesting is when we uh, try to assess the, um, uh, the, the, um, uh, the effect of different uh, focused ultrasound frequency on the blood-brain barrier phenotype. Um, firstly, we did a mathematical model, and our model shows that due to the resonance effect, um, at when the microbubble are excited at 0.5 and 1.5 megahertz, the, the microbubble are oscillating at a similar oscillation, uh, some similar amplitude. But however, because um, um, the, the, the shear strata that created by the microbubble, um, there's a threefold increase for the higher frequency compared to 0.5 megahertz. Um, this is quite interesting, so we did an experiment to validate this, uh, this hypothesis. Um, so what we found is although we, we see a similar vessel increase in the vessel permeability for the both frequency, but what is interesting is that um, we, when we assess the ICAM molecule, which is a molecular probe that is sensitive to shear stress, and what we found is that at 1.5 megahertz, we have a significantly up regulation of ICAM um, compared to 0. Um, megahertz in the sonicated region. And the things consider ICAM is the inflammatory marker, so it has opened up the, the opportunity for uh, modulating the re immune response for immune therapy. So to conclude, um, we found that larger bubble uh, with a more elastic shell have stronger oscillation and leads to a higher vessel permeability under the same acoustic pressure. And also we found that the affinity bubble um, that are excited at 1.5 megahertz have similar vessel permeability but higher upregulation of ICAM expression compared to the lower frequency under the same acoustic pressure. Together, our data shows that microbubble property and um, uh, resonance effect can be used to tune the resulting bio effect and have potential implications for molding, mod, uh, modulating the blood-brain barrier permeability and also the inflammatory responses. So last, I'd like to thank um, our lab and our founding bodies. Thank you. Thank you, very interesting. Next we have Dishuang Yi. Hi, 
Hi, uh, everyone. I first want to thank the foundation gave me great opportunity to present our recent work here. Uh, so I'm Do Zhuang from uh, uh, Washington University in St. Louis in Hong Chen's lab. And uh, today, I want to introduce our recent work is Focus Ultrasound with Michael Babel Accelerate the Glymphatic Transportation. So uh, because I only have a limited time, so I just want to more illustrate you what is a glymphatic system, why we think ultrasound can modulate the glymphatic transportation, and uh, also show uh, quickly show our some result. Um, so first question is, uh, what is a glymphatic system? Our body has a lymphatic system, which is in charge of uh, clear out the body waste. However, brain don't have lymphatic system. Consider our brain is always metabolic active. It uh, uh, clear, uh, it uh, produce a lot of garbage every day. Then how this garbage can be cleared out? So around 10 years before, uh, Nadgar's group has identified uh, the good lymphatic system, which is mimicking the lymphatic function in our body, clear out the brain waste. And the glymphatic system is not a true vessel. As you can see here, it is actually a paravascular space, and uh, uh, which, uh, uh, the, uh, as you can see, the amyloid drug protein, which is uh, the toxic protein abundant in Alzheimer's disease, can be cleared out through the uh, glymphatic system. So uh, for many years of study, people identified the dysfunction of a glymphatic system is associated with multiple brain disease, potentially because uh, when the glymphatic system is dysfunctioned, the, uh, the toxic protein cannot be efficiently clear, clear out from the brain. So we think that modulate the glymphatic transportation maybe can help to uh, accelerate, uh, maybe can help with the treatment of such disease or the laser disease progress. So our question is why the ultrasound can modulate the glymphatic transportation, and we found the rationale that may can. So as we reported that the glymphatic transportation was driven by the paravascular pumping, as you can see here, the molecules in the paravascular space is driven to move forward with the vessel motion. And the previous study from uh, uh, Dr. Hong Chen's PhD work, she also found that uh, microbubble under ultrasound sonication can generate a similar vessel motion. And uh, uh, we call this microbubble pumping. Um, so building on the similarity with the paravascular pumping and the microbubble pumping, we we hypothesis that we want to evaluate uh, the effects uh, with microbubble on the glymphatic transportation with nasal administered agent. And the reason we use nasal administration is because uh, the nasal administered agents was deliver the agents from the nose to brain and utilize the perivascular uh, system of the uh, glymphatic pathway to transport to the whole brain. And it is a totally a non-invasive method. Um, so, uh, so with this uh, uh, nasal, nasal delivery as a tool, and we want to, and then we tr uh, we try to use uh, we we use ultrasound with microbubble and to say whether we can uh, accelerate the transportation of nasal administered agents. So uh, here I'm going to show you some result. So showing here is a microscopic image of a mouse a chrono section brain. And you can see at the focus ultrasound treated side, the glymphatic tracer is more uh, transported and accumulate. And the quantification result found a significantly higher uh, intensity of the tracer at focus ultrasound treated side. And when we look one more step uh, uh, of the tracer uh, to see the microscopic distribution, and we can see the fluorescence tracer, which is uh, uh, showing by the red color, they are actually travel within the paravascular space, which is identified by the astrocyte interfit showing by the uh, blue color and the vessel wall showing by the green color. And it is consistent with either the large vessel and the small vessel. 
But for the non-treated site, we didn't find observable the tracer uh, at the same explorer time. So after looking at the ultrasound effect on the vessel transportation, we also look into whether it can uh, uh, penetrate. So it uh, here shows uh, uh, here shows the confocal fluorescence image, and the red color is a glymphatic tracer. You can see at the ultrasound after the ultrasound treatment, uh, they are not only uh, travel along the vessels; actually, they are also penetrate to the deeper uh, brain which is indicated by the uh, white arrow. Uh, so uh, the red color means uh, the, the glymphatic delivered tracer. So that means that the focus ultrasound with microbial can also help with uh, the drug delivery through the glymphatic system. Uh, so in conclusion, we found with uh, fast with microbial can enhance the uh, nasal administered uh, albumin tracer transport to the fast targeted brain region. And uh, 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 it enhances the tracer transport within the paravascular space. And some data I didn't show is the tracer was mostly traveled along the arterials. And the last, uh, uh, the uh, focus ultrasound with microbial can enhance the extravasation of the glymphatic tracer to the interstitial space. So finding from this study uh, indicate a fast with microbial has a great potential to non-invasively modulate the glymphatic transportation and potentially can be utilized either uh, for the brain drug delivery through the glymphatic system or the waste clearance of the central nervous system. And uh, uh, in the end, I would love to uh, thank uh, our chance ultrasound lab uh, and also the funding agency. And thanks for your attention. Thank you, Zhou Zhang. Uh, next up, we have Sheng Chen. Hello everyone, my name is Shen Chen from University of Virginia, and it's my great honor to give this presentation. So uh, Parkinson's disease and essential tremor are movement disorders among millions of patients, and many of the patients are not candidates for surgery or would prefer a non-surgical option. I might guide you focus ultrasound is a minimally invasive method for treating these disorders. During the treatment, ultrasound goes through the school and brain and focuses on tacky tissue leading to ablation. The school also absorbs the energy, which results in unintended heating of the brain and, and the school and the softer tissue. However, this, no direct monitoring of this heating exists, and the estimation of waiting time between sonications can only be made using simple models. To address this issue, a rapid MI method for simultaneously monitoring the temperature of the bone and the, uh, the softer tissue during fast surgery is necessary. And the uh, prevailing MI is the monitoring methods, protein resonance frequency shift is uh, based on the temperature dependent phase shift and with the same coefficient for various tissues such as brain and muscle. However, PIF is not practical for short tissue tissues such as brain, uh, such as school because the, the PIF requires, requires time for a phase accumulation, but the signal of such tissue decays in a period of time that is much shorter than the normal echo time. Variable flip angle T1 mapping with the ultra short echo time MS sequence is the alternative, which uses a linear regression model to, to measure T1. Therefore, combining these two thermometry methods using this MS sequence has the potential to simultaneously monitoring bone and, and soft tissue. Here, uh, in this work, we use a dual echo 3D spiral UT MS sequence, which has a short rectangular F pulse, variable slice encoding, and spiral trajectories, so that a rapid scan over a larger volume is possible. Uh, we have the first echo with a ultra short echo time, designed for capturing the quickly decaying signal of cortical bone and the second echo for PIF in soft tissue. And the resolution and the volume is shown here. Uh, the, the scan for each flip angle takes 36 seconds. So the temporal resolution for the PRF and VFA is 36 seconds and 72 seconds respectively. 
and cooling and heating experiments were conducted using this method. Uh, in the cooling experiment, uh, the Fenton has a cost of has a piece of a cortical bone surrounded by agar gel, both inside and outside. Three optical fibers were placed inside the bone, the, the inner gel, and outer gel, respectively. Near each fiber, a 4x4 four four pixel RI was selected. The fainting was kept in water bath for 50 minutes before the scan, 20 minutes waiting time between samples. The figure on the right shows the, the, the changes of temperature and T1 during the cooling process. Uh, the data was smoothed over four scans and averaged across our eyes. The PIF temperature of the gel was within a 1.5 degrees Celsius deviation from the values from by the optical fibers. And the linear relationship between the temperature and T1 of the bone can be observed. And the sensitivity coefficient was calculated at 2.51 milliseconds per degree Celsius. Uh, in the heating experiment, the, the small animal fast system was used. Uh, the fintan was similar to the one previously used, and the bottom of the plastic cylinder container was removed so the ultrasound could penetrate the gel and reach vertically the bone gel boundary. Three sonications, each spans 140, minutes, uh, 140 seconds. And two three by five RI was selected near the boundary in a bone and a gel, so that we could assume that their temperatures were approximately the same no t temporal averaging. The results were shown in the figures on the right. At the top is the te PRF temperature of the gel versus the VFA T1 of the bone. At the bottom is the fitting result between them. And the sensitivity coefficient was calculated at 3.86 milliseconds per degree Celsius. And this is the conclusion. Thanks very much for your attention. Thank you, Shen. Next we have Xiaoyu Li. Hi, my name is Judy Li. I'm a PhD student in the Lisa Konofagus group and uh, Columbia University. And today I'll be talking about a real-time monitoring method during focus ultrasound named harmonic motion imaging guided focus ultrasound in in vivo breast cancer mouse model and patients. So FUS, as we know, can cause tissue death through thermal or mechanical ablation. And it is a potential alternative to chemical and molecularly targeted therapeutic approaches, which can be attractive for cases such as triple negative breast cancer. Previous studies have shown immune modulatory effects of FUS monotherapy, but to our knowledge, no studies have shown complete pathological response of FUS monotherapy in TNBC models, and also there's a need for real-time monitoring of FUS ablation. So harmonic motion imaging is a radiation force-based ultrasound elasticity imaging technique um, that can measure tissue displacement by inducing oscillatory tissue motion. Our group has shown that HMI can be used for ablation monitoring, termed HMI-guided FUS, um, in which HMI is used to measure mechanical tissue property changes that occur due to FUS ablation. And we have also shown HMI for imaging applications in which HMI is used to measure mechanical properties of soft tissues. So the objectives of this study is to demonstrate feasibility of real-time HMI-guided FUS monitoring to detect the onset and extent of ablation lesioning. And a second objective is HMI longitudinal monitoring of the tissue property changes that occur following FUS ablation. And our hypothesis here is that HMI longitudinal imaging can be used to assess the presence of tumor growth and recurrence, or the long-term efficacy of FUS ablation. So for this study, we had a longitudinal mouse study with six female BELPC mice. The 41 luciferase mouse model was used, which is an orthotopic TNBC mouse model. And the tumors were implanted on both abdominal mammary glands. Uh, 41 luciferase was used because it's a TNBC model and also because it enables bioluminescence Im imaging of the tumors with the luciferase enzyme, and we use the IVIS imaging system for bioluminescence imaging. So for the study, in order to demonstrate efficacy, tumors were ablated on one flank only with a contralateral flank used as negative control, um, and one mouse was used for negative control and received no FUS ablation on either flank. And the timeline is on the, at the right, with day zero defined as the day of FUS ablation. Bioluminescence imaging was performed three days before and immediately after ablation, and then HMI and bioluminescence imaging was performed every week following ablation. Uh, we also recruited one uh, patient for our clinical trial. Um, the patient was a 47-year-old female patient with IDC, and uh, according to our clinical trial, HMI-guided FUS was applied immediately before her scheduled segmentectomy. 
Um, these are, this is our imaging setup. So we had a confocal imaging and FUS transducer, and only one site was lesioned within the tumors, so there was no raster scanning of the lesions. And again, uh, data processing was performed in real time during treatment, so beam forming, filtering, and displacement estimation was performed um, during the HMI-guided FUS treatment, with processing, displaying, and um, saving of the data happening for about four seconds per RF frame set. So these are the bioluminescence imaging results. Um, we can see at uh, comparing three days before ablation and uh, immediately after ablation, in the control mouse, we can see that there is more luminescence um, at day zero compared to day minus three, which is expected as the tumor grows, and that there is no difference, um, significant difference between the left and right tumors. But for mice two through six, which did receive ablation uh, on the right flank, as shown in the red box, um, there is less luminescence in the ablated tumor compared to the non-ablated tumor. And this is especially the case in mouse number two, in which the luminescence of the ablated tumor is the same as the background. And then uh, after uh, following the ablation day, we can see that for mouse two, there's actually no recurrence of the tumor that was ablated, both in gross pathology and with bioluminescence imaging. However, there was recurrence for mice three through six. Uh, so these are some examples of what HMI guided FUS monitoring looks like in two mice, um, mouse number two and mouse number four. So in the middle panel of each of the examples, we can see that the displacement uh, increases at the ROI1, which is the focus of FUS. It increases and then decreases during ablation, which indicates that ablation has occurred. Um, so this shows that, oh, and we did see this trend in all of the uh, tumors that were ablated, which shows that HMI could be used to monitor the um, onset of ablation. And then here are some examples of HMI uh, maps that were acquired uh, over time in the non-ablated tumor. So as expected, we can see in both the BMOs and HMI displacement maps that the tumor volume increases um, over time and the displacement decreases over time. But in the ablated tumors, comparing, um, especially looking at the tumor that had complete re uh, remission, at day seven, we see that there is a mass in the B mode. But interestingly, in the HMI displacement map, this uh, region is actually has a softer, is softer or has increased displacement as compared to the neighboring tissue. Um, and then following day seven, we do not see evidence of a tumor in the memory gland in both B mode and HMI displacement. Um, and then for the partial remission, interestingly, even though we did see a decrease in tumor volume in the initial time points, uh, we did not see the same uh, amount of softening as we did with complete remission. So this suggests that HMI could potentially be used as a biomarker for differentiating partial versus complete remission. These are the combined metrics across all six mice. Again, we can see that for the, com the mouse that experienced complete remission, there was a decrease in cross-sectional area, an increase in HMI displacement, and a decrease in radiance over time um, as compared to the rest of the mice. And then lastly, I just want to show um, the patient that received HMI guided FUS. So for this patient, again, we can see the similar trend of, in displacement uh, with an increase and then a decrease in displacement, um, which indicates that uh, our pipeline and our system could be used for clinical applications. So in conclusion, um, for our first aim, we showed that HMI guided FUS showed a trend in displacement decrease, which indicates lesion formation. And our second aim, uh, the conclusion for our second aim was that the control tumor and the tumors that recurred following ablation decrease in HMI displacement over time, but the tumor with complete remission softened over time, which shows the preliminary potential of HMI as a biomarker for tumor response to FUS treatment. And again, I'd like to highlight that we did see complete remission of the tumor of one mouse following FUS ablation, which shows the potential of FUS as a monotherapy treatment. Um, in the future, we'd like to optimize our imaging parameters and also investigate immune monitory effects of FUS ablation. And then I'd, I'd just like to thank our funding sources, um, our group, and our collaborators. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Shu Yu. Um, this is just a reminder for everybody in the audience that if you have questions for the presenters, please add them to the platform and they will answer you there as we will not have time to answer questions live today. All right, next we have Abdul Karim Ahmed. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Abdul Karim Ahmed. I'm a fifth year neurosurgery resident at the University of Maryland. <clears throat> it is an honor to speak to you today to talk to, to you about our trial results uh, for bilateral focus ultrasound central lateral thalamotomy for refractory trigeminal neuralgia 
a project I've been working on with uh, Dr. Gandhi and Dr. Eisenberg. Uh, working on disclosures. So uh, trigeminal neuralgia, in case you haven't uh, come across it, there's a lot of, it's very uh, amazing. We have so many diseases that we're using focus ultrasound for. for so just, just as a, a quick review, uh, it's a unilateral uh, shock-like pain that you feel on one or both sides of the face, uh, and it's excruciating. It's sometimes called the suicide disease. Um, touching your face, brushing, eating, anything like that can sometimes uh, cause this pain to come on, and there's about 10 to 15,000 new cases uh, annually. It's the most common cause of facial pain. Up to 20 or 72 percent of these patients have a vascular loop that's impinging the nerve root, uh, which uh, brought about the surgery microvascular decompression by Walter Danny, then Peter Janetta, and it tends to be very efficacious if medications aren't working. There are other uh, neuroablative surgeries uh, targeting the Gasserian ganglion that are helpful in this disease as well. But overall, the point is that a significant portion of patients will be refractory to these treatments. And because of the way these patients experience this pain, they may lose their jobs, they can't uh, hold down their job, they can't function like this. It's a very significant disease. So uh, one target that we can use uh, in patients like this is the central lateral nucleus of the thalamus. It used to be called the medial thalamus. Um, it transfers nociceptive information uh, from the somatosensory ner nervous system to higher centers and more affective uh, components of the ner pain neuromatrix. And it's been shown by Jean Menard and others that it's a critical node in this thalamocortical dysrhythmia that underlies neuropathic pain. We actually recently finished our uh, trial for refractory neuropathic pain, not trigeminal pain. Uh, and we found a significant decrease on s several pain scales uh, in patients using the bra brief pain inventory and the pain disability index and the numeric rating scale. And as you can see, we found a significant decrease in their uh, subjective components of pain, uh, somewhere between uh, 30 to 45 percent in, in most uh, patients. Uh, and we were encouraged by this when we finished uh, treating these uh, 9 to 10 patients to look at trigeminal neuralgia because this treatment is especially effective if your pain is episodic and what better disease to look at that's episodic than trigeminal neuralgia which comes and goes. So, so our trial design is to enroll 10 patients to perform bilateral central lateral thalamotomy. This is a single arm non-randomized study. We wanted to evaluate the safety and efficacy of using this intervention in the treatment of refra refractory trigeminal neuralgia and then uh, we wanted to assess it using validated pain scales like the brief pain inventory facial, the patient global impression of change, and the Barrow Neurological Institute pain in intensity scale. So we wanted to include patients with chronic severe uh, refractory trigeminal neuralgia between the ages of 21 and 75. They've had it for six months or more, and they've failed medical management, failed surgical management, or were ineligible for surgical management. And of course, they're capable of sitting in an MRI scanner awake. If anyone that had prior CNS disease or DBS or anything like that, of course, could not be included. And these are the five patients we've treated. We've actually treated six patients now, but when I made this, we have completed five, and five have uh, exited the study. You can see their uh, age ranges and their skull density ratios. So this one patient experienced this pain for 21 years, and four out of the five had at least one microvascular decompression, and the other one was ineligible, so they had gamma knife radiosurgery to the Gasserian ganglion. And these are patients that are on multiple medications and they're seeking some sort of solution. Uh, sorry, this is backwards. And these are our treatment parameters. And I think the important thing to note is that it took about 128 minutes of sonication to treat these patients. This is done outpatient, uh, just like with uh, essential tremor and VIM thalamotomy. We were able to perform bilateral thalamotomy in all these patients. Uh, so five patients have followed to six months. There have been no serious adverse events. Four patients uh, had headache or pin site tenderness, uh, and those kind of things resolved. One patient had nausea and anxiety, and again, that resolved. And then in terms of the BPI facial scale, we found a 67% decrease uh, over a six-month period, which was significant. In the BNI pain intensity scale, we found a 40.9% uh, decrease, which is also significant. And in the patient global impression of change, their impression of how much better they got, we found a 440% increase in, in that, that estimation from patients. This is an example of bilateral central lateral thalamotomy. You can see the T2 edema around the lesions, which will subside. One patient stopped their oxcarbazepine, one patient stopped their baclofen. 
So in conclusion, bilateral central lateral thalamotomy is feasible and generally safe. Uh, in the patients we treated, we are building it on our experience from our prior neuropathic pain trial. Uh, for patients with refractory trigeminal neuralgia, um, this treatment is associated with decrease in pain using validated pain scales. We do intend to do a randomized controlled trial, and uh, it is possible this will help patients reduce their pain medication use. These are my references. I want to, I want to thank Dr. Gandhi, who's an extremely gracious uh, mentor. Uh, our captains, Dr. Eisenberg and Dr. Woodworth, the Focus Ultrasound Foundation, and the entire team. And I just want to say that it's an exciting time in pain surgery because a lot of these surgeries have been abandoned or forgotten because of how morbid they used to be 40 or 50 years ago. And now they can be completed outpatient, uh, non-invasively, so stay tuned. Thank you so much. Next is Alexander In. All right, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alex In. I am a second year medical student at Virginia Tech Carilion School of Medicine. I work with Dr. Wynn Legon at the Non Invasive Ultrasound Lab. And today I'll be presenting some preliminary data of our study looking at low intensity focused ultrasound to the insula with both the attenuation of the contact heat evoked potential along with the reduction in pain perception in humans. So with some background, the insula is part of the cerebral cortex deep to the lateral sulcus covered by the frontal operculum and has both an anterior and posterior lobule composed of individual gyri. Now, the insula is a promising target for pain mitigation, as it not only receives majority of the direct disynaptic spinothalamic projections, which we know is a sensory tract involved with nociception, but it also, the contact heat evoked potential has been sourced to the insula, as we see with these various tracings of the um, gyri of both the anterior and posterior insula. Now, the problem with trying to target the insula for neuromodulation, it is deep within that lateral sulcus. So current non-invasive neuromodulation techniques, such as the transcranial magnetic um, um, stimulation um, only has negligible portions of that electric field actually reaching the insula, lacking both the depth penetration and spatial specificity that LIFU can demonstrate. So with all this, we want to know if we can modulate the anterior and posterior insula, and does it indeed affect neural pain signatures along with the perception of pain? That leads us to our hypotheses. First, that LIFU can target both the anterior and posterior insula individually. Second, LIFU to the left anterior insula attenuates that P1 amplitude of the contact heat evoked potential, or CHEP, affecting the unpleasantness of pain, whereas a, a LIFU to the left posterior insula attenuates the N1 amplitude of the CHEP, um, affecting the intensity. And finally, LIFU to the left anterior and posterior insula reduces subjective pain perception. So to do this, we use the quantitative sensory testing, or QST machine as seen here, to provide a brief contact heat stimulus to the dorsum of the hand with our thermal probe seen here. And we use the perceived pain rating scale of zero to nine. So we began by thresholding each participant to a pain six out of nine, and then LIFU was stereotypically targeted to either the left anterior insula or posterior insula. Um, and uh, we used a single element focus transistor with the following parameters. Uh, we counterbalanced the inactive sham with LIFU, um, concurrent with EEG, uh, provided 40 stimulations with a random ISI of 10 to 20 seconds, and then had the participants rate their pain. If we blow up one of the stims here, we see that continuous EEG recording in the back uh, with CHEP stimulus at time zero. We time locked that with our LIFU stimulation 200 milliseconds before and 800 milliseconds after to ensure that temporal overlap of the two signals. Our outcomes included both the N1P1 peak to peak amplitude of the CHEP and also that perceived pain rating scale. So we'll start with the anterior insula here. We co-registered the MRI and CT scans for acoustic modeling, and this is an example of one of our participants. We see both the coronal and transverse sections there. If we take the slice and view the insula laterally, we see that we can demonstrate single gyre resolution over the anterior insula. With our EEG data, at the top we see the average tracings over the 40 cycles of a single participant, where the black line represents jam and the red line represents LIFU. Below is the pseudo color trial by trial map, which all contributes to that average tracing above, demonstrating the attenuation of that N1P1 peak to peak amplitude. Uh, we did see with our group analysis a statistically significant reduction of about eight microvolts between sham and LIFU for the anterior insula. But for our behavior data, uh, we only saw about a 0.5 drop in the perceived rating scale, which was not statistically significant. 
Uh, very similar here with our poster insula acoustic modeling again, demonstrating just like the anterior insula single gyre resolution. We also saw an attenuation of the N1 P1 peak to peak amplitude for the poster insula and also saw a statistically significant reduction here about six microvolts between SHEM and LIFU for our group analysis. Um, but unfortunately, again, we, for our behavior data, we did not reach the statistically significant difference between SHEM and LIFU about 0.5. So for conclusions, our single element 500 kilohertz transducer LIFU can successfully target both the anterior and posterior insula individually with single gyro resolution. Uh, LIFU to the anterior and posterior insula attenuates that N1 P1 peak to peak amplitude for CHEP. And finally, LIFU to the anterior and posterior insula decreases pain ratings to heat stimulus um, to the dorsum of the hand. So for future goals, we'd like to continue to increase the number of healthy normal participants to better compare and contrast the anterior and posterior insula for both the contact heap evoked potential and perception of pain, while also demonstrating the neuromodulation uh, abilities of LIFU, and also um, further test the relationship of insula to pain to hopefully um, develop some clinical trials for chronic pain conditions. I'd like to thank my lab family and mentors, the Steel Innovation Fund, FBRI, for supporting our study, the Focus Ultrasound Foundation for holding the symposium, and then shout out to Verisonics for the Young Investigator Award. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Next, we have Stephen Lee. Hi. I'm Stephen Lee, I'm from Columbia University. I'm with uh, Elisa Konofagu's lab, and today I'll be talking about, again, how focus ultrasound can uh, lower pain perception in neuropathic pain patients using focus ultrasound nerve stimulation. So starting off, we all know that our peripheral nervous systems are involved in our sensory experiences, shaping how we experience the world around us. It's involved in touch, vibration, also temperature, but also our sensations of pain. Um, and what we call this is healthy nociceptive pain. But in <clears throat> neuropathic pain, where it's a disease or lesion to the nervous system itself, uh, it can be often very debilitating for patients. And neuropathic pain prevalence estimates between 3 and 70 percent of the general population, but is expected to grow. And in ad addition to the chronic neuropathic pain, there's also other comorbid co comorbidities and other symptoms that are uh, associated with it, Increase, increasing drug prescriptions as well as uh, increased visitations to the doctor. And if we compare this to uh, other neurostimulation techniques that are lacking in efficacy, uh, especially in spatial targeting, as well as uh, other invasive and prone to surgical complication uh, elect implanted electro techniques. And so focused ultrasound can alleviate this, and we know that it can modulate brain circuits, specific neurons, ion channels, and peripheral nerves in mice. In our ex vivo studies, we see that we can induce action potentials in different uh, nerve fibers, uh, as well as see action potential probability over sonication energy, and as well as in vivo uh, uh, sonications to the uh, peripheral sciatic nerve, we can see that focused ultrasound can evoke compound muscle activation. And so the question is whether we can use focus ultrasound nerve stimulation to uh, affect our pain sensations. It's first looking in a healthy population on nociceptive pain, but then further going on to a clinical population of neuropathic pain. And so in this, we use a 1.1 megahertz four element annular array so that we can steer the beam. Uh, we use a five millisecond pulse, and so we're using a single sonication for healthy populations and a train of sonications in a clinical population. And the, in the healthy uh, subjects, we're looking for uh, pressures between 0 to 7.8 megapascals. And in the clinical uh, patient, we settle on a 4.8 megapascal uh, um, pressure. And this is the, uh, the system we're using. We're just using a Verisonics Vantage 256 element with a high-foo and extended burst options. And so in this case, we can have an imaging transducer confocally aligned with our focus transducer for uh, real-time imaging. And there's a lot of talk at this uh, um, conference about target engagement. We can actually do this real time using displacement of the nerve itself. We can identify with B mode, apply our focus off some pulses, and then study the nerve displacements as a biomarker for neuropathic pain uh, treatment. And then afterwards, we ask the, on a scale from 0 to 10 how uh, for the patient or the subject to rate their pain ratings. And so does FUS alter nervous pain? In order to do this, we have a first training sequence where the patient gets used to our um, 
experimental setup, and then we have a randomized sequence of 14 trials with uh, sham and ultrasound stimulation, uh, precisionly timed to the thermal stimulation, and we apply the focus ultrasound upstream of our thermal stimulation to the median nerve, uh, which innervates the C6 dermatome at the thermal stimulation. And here we're using 13 healthy subjects, five males, eight females ages 20 to 40, and this is also in a, done in a double-blind fashion, so the patient does not know when the focus ultrasound is on, and I also do not know. And what we see is a lot of variable responses. Some of these patients did experience uh, decreases within their own subjective ratings to the focus ultrasound. If we look across the groups, we see a 0.28 decrease in the pain rating units. Not significant, but trending. And if we look actually at the 2D displacement map where we can map, because we can measure nerve displacement, we can plot nerve displacement across the changes in ratings. We see that there are three subgroups within our data. And if we separate the pain ratings from before uh, for the mean change in ratings, we see that there's an adequate uh, amount of nerve displacement that's required to see any sort of um, pain rating decreases. Now, this is in uh, no susceptible pain, so how does this work in neuropathic pain? Now, because we're using mechanical stimulation, we employed a neuropathic pain population that has robust and repeatable pain to a mechanical stimulation. We can do 40 trials, 20 FUS, 20 sham, randomized, also double blind. And in this, we're using a pulse sequence uh, before and after the mechanical stimulation. And here, we employ 10 neuropathic pain patients, three male, seven female, ages 51 to 74, six on-target nerve, and four off-target sham. <clears throat> and so we can apply a mechanical stimulator to induce that pain. And the targeted nerves, uh, there's a variety of targeted nerves that we're uh, employing in this study, ulnar, sciatic, sural, tibial, common peroneal nerve. They have different pathologies, um, but what's really striking is the amount uh, and variety of symptoms that they had. Um, of course, they had robust and repeatable pain to mechanical probing, but they also had radiating, throbbing pain, persistent heat, electricity, and paresthesia, and persistent pain. And Accordingly, we do not get any significance between the patients themselves. Um, if we look at uh, all the patients uh, with change in ratings, this is not a very significant uh, decrease. But what is telling is that with the six on target and the four off target, there is a difference between uh, patient, the pain ratings in patients that received ultrasound to the nerve and ones that received ultrasound off the nerve. And if we do the same sort of analysis, we see that there are also the same similar trending um, uh, distributions for the nerve displacements with the changes in ratings. And if we uh, also sort our rating, pain ratings by the amount of displacements, we see a similar trend. And I just want to bring up the comparison between the first and the second one, which shows that there is some sort of uh, translation from healthy populations to neuropathic pain patients, meaning or indicating that nerve displacement might be a viable biomarker for uh, changes in pain for nerve stimulation. Uh, so in conclude, uh, FUS decreased pain perception by 0.28. Uh, there was no acute changes in neuropathic pain patients. However, uh, on-target stimulation versus off-target stimulation in neuropathic pain patients had a m bigger uh, decrease by 3.16 units. And in both studies, nerve displacement decreased the pain ratings, albeit the optimal displacement window was different for, uh, was smaller for neuropathic pain patients. And so in order to further this work, uh, of course, it's a subjective measurement, so we want to include other more advanced pain metrics, such as the McGill pain questionnaires and also EEGs, maybe the CHEPs the, um, of the previous um, presentation. And then what this off-target to on-target suggests to us is that there's a longitudinal effect within the same patient population, as in this continuous stimulation over time seem to decrease pain perceptions in the patients. So wondering what is the right dose, how often, what the frequency of these um, treatments will lead to greater pain decrease. And so like, with that, I'd like to acknowledge everybody that helped, the foundation, and all my funding sources, and of course, my lab. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Next, we have Javier Barsenas. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Javier Kenko. I'm a postdoc in Cathy Ferrer's lab, uh, Department of uh, Radiology at Stanford School of Medicine. And today I want to talk to you how we do local delivery of AB into murine brain, um, employing ultrasound, and how we are able to quantify this by PET in a non-invasive manner. Um, so first, let's, let's go straight to the point, what are AVs? AVs are typically and generally single-stranded desoxyribrinoclake acid encapsulated within 25 nanometer protein capsets. 
They saw um, a very strong potential as gene therapy platform um, due to a strong clinical safety profile and also the low, pa low patho pathogenicity. Um, so far, there are only two FDA AEB uh, vector-based approved gene therapies in the market, Luxtruna and Tolgensma, and none of them are for the treatment of neuropathologies. And one of the reasons might be the very limited BBB transport or even known um, of these vehicles. Um, um, the recent years we have seen how some groups, they've published works on how they do the local delivery of AEB employing ultrasound and microbubble technology, but they have assessed this delivery only by invasive methods, and that's where we thought we could make our contribution. So what's our, our approach? So after the microbubble dose injection, um, there are two different strategies. First, we uh, deliver um, a radio label AEB encapsulating a peri-reporter gene, in this case, PKM2, or a fluorescence reporter pot protein. In both cases, we're gonna perform, uh, we're gonna apply our, our uh, ultrasound-guided focused ultrasound treatment that we monitorize by photoacoustic mapping to ensure stable cavitation patterns. And then we will perform the imaging. So with PET, we are able to quantify the accumulation uh, of the capsid. And with per reported gene, we're gonna see how this capsid is able to deliver the genetic material transduction, right? All in vivo in a non-invasive way. And also we can perform optical imaging um, to see the expression of the fluorescence uh, protein, uh, protein, reported protein. So it was crucial for the PET imaging, the radio labeling strategy of the AEB. So we modified the surface of the capsid um, by in a conjugation with a peptide-based multicalator and allow us to incorporate up to eight copper-64 atoms. Uh, I cannot go through all the optimization me uh, method, but basically we were trying different areas, um, pressures, and, and, um, and duration of the treatment, and we ended up using 600 kilopascal during two minutes tar targeting the hippocampus area, and we don't see under these conditions any uh, red blood cell extravasation. Um, so we did ex vivo quantification, and this is where we observed the highest fold increase uh, of accumulation of the capsid in the treated area versus the non-treated hemisphere, up to almost four, four-fold increase in it. We are able to correlate that um, with what we see in the PET scan. As you can see, the, the green coil is a treated area in the right hemisphere, and that correlates pretty well with the PET scan at uh, 21 hours post-injection. As you can see, there is a hot spot in the treated area. It's absent in the non-treated hemisphere, and of course, we compare with the non-treated control where it's absent as well and we are able to do the quantification in vivo in a non-invasive way, uh, correlating pretty well with the ex vivo one, almost 3.5 fold increase in uh, accumulation, increase in accumulation of the, of the capsid in the treated area. Um, per report gene, so per report gene is a strategy that allows us to do a quantification of the transaction in vivo with a per reporter dual probe. So after internalization of our capsid, into the cell, it's able to deliver the genetic material into the nucleus, single-stranded DNA. That will serve as a template to generate mRNA, and that mRNA contains all the information necessary for the cell to synthesize the protein of interest. Um, we reach certain level of expression, and after three weeks, we are able to inject what we have called the pair reporter prof. Is this molecule right here is DASA, DASA 10 that is also internalized into the cell. It's able to cross the BBB and selectively binds to the protein. So you are able to see and visualize that in the PET scan, right? So then you can correlate the expression of the gene with the accumulation of the tracer. And this is what we see actually in the PET scan again. In the treated hemisphere, in this case the right one, we see uh, that hot spot um, as accumulation of the tracer. As you can see, it's very well defined, um, circling green and it increases, uh, the treatment, focus ultrasound uh, treatment, increases up to seven, uh, we observe seven-fold increase in the accumulation of the tracer, meaning seven-fold increase in the expression of the gene in the treated area. Um, also, we compare with the optical imaging. As you can see, only in the uh, right hemisphere, we can see expression of the fluorescence protein, um, and neon green in this case, in comparison with the, uh, with the left one, where it's almost absent, and also absent in a non-treated control. Uh, right hemisphere. So with this, I want to conclude that um, the use of microbubbles jointly uh, with uh, ultrasound-guided focus ultrasound treatment um, uh, facilitated a temporal restriction of the BBB, facilitating the AB transduction in a stable manner, and we are able to visualize but also to quantify in vivo in a non-invasive manner 
um, this delivery, and also we are able to see that by optical imaging. And with this, I want to thank the uh, bodies, um, the, the funding agencies, and of course uh, my PI, Cathy Ferrara, and my amazing team, and of course you for all your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you, Javier. Next, we've got uh, Dojong Yi back to present another abstract. Hi, it's me again. So, uh, I was just talking about the glymphatic transportation that can help with drug delivery. So here is one application of deliver the AV utilized focus ultrasound mediated intranasal delivery. So advantage of uh, use this method is it can like uh, do target delivery, uh, but with minimized system exposure. Okay, uh, and uh, thanks for the previous presenter, however, so I will skip this uh, slides of introducing what is AV, so directly uh, talk to the challenge. So the AV-based gene therapy is uh, really popular, but actually the AV delivery to brain is uh, limited. Uh, uh, the uh, AV-based gene therapy used for treating the brain disease. Uh, currently, the most used uh, uh, AV delivery method is uh, direct injection and intravenous injection. But direct injection requires uh, draining the hole to the skull, which is uh, very invasive. And also, the AV delivery can, uh, is very localized, only can come out a super small region. For treating a lot of neurodegeneration disease, which is uh, affecting a large brain area, this method is not really applicable. The intravenous injection can deliver the AV to the whole brain, but uh, it needs to special uh, design of the capsid to cross the blood brain barrier. And more importantly, it needs to deliver the AV uh, through the blood circulation, which uh, will lead to the whole body organs exposed to the AV and potentially can cause some systemic toxicity to the organs. And actually, the liver toxicity is one of the major concerns of AV-based uh, uh, gene therapy. And you can also use fast VVD, but uh, like Howard said, but it can also, it also needs the AV to be intravenous injected and in blood circulation. So building on those concerns, uh, we propose to use focus ultrasound combined uh, with uh, uh, intranasal delivery, so uh, which can non-invasively non and efficiently deliver AV to the mouth brain and uh, can achieve a low systemic toxicity or exposure. Uh, so, uh, and also, uh, we get the idea is because we found, uh, we heard that uh, uh, coronavirus can enter the brain uh, through the nose, so AV AV is a kind of virus, so why don't we try uh, nasal delivery of AV? Uh, so uh, to test our hypothesis, we used the AV5 encoded EGFP, a uh, green fluorescent gene, uh, to uh, test. And we did the AV delivery through the nose to the brain, and we used focus ultrasound, either target the motor cortex of the brain stem, which represent the superficial brain area and the deep brain area. And after one month, we sacrificed the mouse and did the post process. We also add the direct injection, uh, intranasal delivery only, and the focus ultrasound with microbubble induced blood brain barrier disruption as our comparison group. So now we can look at the result. Uh, if we see at the uh, left top, it is uh, the focus ultrasound with intranasal delivery, and focus ultrasound was targeting at the motor cortex. The green fluorescent signal represents uh, the successful delivery of AA, AV and the subsequent uh, expression of the EGFP gene. Uh, and uh, uh, the, it is uh, comparable to the direct injection method. We also used the DDPCR quantification to quantify the AAV delivery, and we found the fusion can reach uh, like a uh, uh, comparable delivery efficiency uh, compared with direct injection. But of course, you can see the dose for direct injection is definitely lower. 
So uh, building on that, uh, we confirmed that Fusion can non-invasively uh, deliver the AV to the cortex where the focus ultrasound was targeted. And then we want to look at the systemic exposure. To, uh, to evaluate the systemic exposure, uh, we harvest the major organ from the mouse uh, when we sacrifice the mouse. And we used the DDPCR to quantify the AV concentration in different organs. Uh, so you can see in most organs, like spleen, liver, intestine, kidney, stomach, heart, so the uh, uh, fusion delivery uh, reached the uh, uh, significant lower AV accumulated in the major organs. Uh, and the fast BVD, uh, because the AV is intravenously injected, so it, uh, it is reason about that more AV was accumulated in different organs. And we found the fusion reached uh, like more AV accumulated in lung, and uh, we thought that might be because we used a special AV serotype, which is AV5, that was reported uh, is more uh, is more efficient to trans uh, trans transduce the airway. So for now, we already know the key message, like uh, focus ultrasound compared with intranasal delivery can locally enhance the AV delivery to the focus ultrasound targeted brain uh, with uh, low systemic exposure. So we're almost done. And then we test uh, the uh, deep brain region, uh, the brain stem. So you can see uh, showing by the uh, green color, uh, when focus ultrasound targeted the brain stem, uh, it also reached the more efficient, uh, more more delivery of AV to the brainstem. So it means like uh, the fusion delivery can deliver AV to multiple brain regions, depends on where uh, your ultrasound was targeted. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, this study demonstrated uh, fast with intranasal delivery, uh, administration AV can achieve efficient AV delivery and the gene transduction at ultrasound targeted brain region. And uh, this method can minimize the systemic exposure or biodistribution of AV to other major organs. So it suggests that fusion is a promising uh, technology for AV delivery to, to brain and with the potential to translate to clinical for the treatment of CNS disease because it can reduce your concern for the liver toxicity. And uh, in the end, I still want to uh, thank my lovely lab and the founding agents, and uh, thanks for your attention again. <laughs> thank you, Dojong. Next, we have Ryan Jones. Hi everyone, um, I'm Ryan, I'm a research physicist at Sunnybrook in Toronto, and I'd just like to thank the foundation for the opportunity to present our work, um, experience treating uh, women with uterine fibroids with a new MR-guided focal social sound system. Um, so as we are all well aware, um, phased arrays uh, in common, or compared to traditional single element transducers provide uh, full electronic control of beam geometry and direction when we're doing these treatments, and they can also allow for uh, more complex sonication strategies like uh, rapid scanning of the beam, uh, multi-foci, anti-foci, et cetera. Um, and existing MR-guided focus ultrasound body systems um, today are uh, uh, comprised of relatively large element spherically curved systems of approximately 200 elements or so. And these systems have limited electronic steering ranges, which means that the transducer needs to be mechanically translated or rotated to treat large volumes. Um, and this can be slow uh, and cause MR artifacts. So if we've been working on a new array design for a number of years now, and um, we published a, sort of a prototype system a few years back, and today I'd like to present uh, sort of uh, results in, in our first trial using a more clinical scale system uh, of a fully electronically steerable uh, MR-guided focal center array. So here's the system. Um, it's comprised of transducer modules. Each module is an eight by eight grid of square uh, transducer PZT elements which are just under 1.4 by 1.4 millimeters in size. They operate at a half a megahertz when driven in their lateral vibration mode, and it satisfies the half wavelength inter-element spacing criteria to be able to steer electronically anywhere in the field without introducing grading lobes. Um, the full array, um, as shown here on the right, is uh, comprised of 96 of these modules for just over 6,000 elements, and they're arranged in a circular pattern uh, with a diameter of about 17 centimeters. 
Um, and this array is MR compatible, so this one on the right is, is compatible with our Siemens Prisma that we have at Sunnybrook, um, and it allows us to do multiplanar MR thermometry. So we get two two-dimensional planes that are orthogonal uh, about every six seconds, and the system is also um, capable of doing cavitation monitoring with a, a sparse boundary array. So uh, we just finished our first uh, clinical trial with this system, or at least the ultrasound aspect. So it was a pilot, first in human feasibility trial. Uh, we treated 50 patients, um, just wrapped up in August. Um, so the first 11 patients were treated using a smaller, uh, a first generation uh, device which had a smaller aperture, so a, fewer, a smaller element count. Um, and then the remainder patients were treated on this uh, bigger system. And the patients received uh, they were followed up with clinical questionnaires and MR imaging uh, up to 12 months post-treatment. So this is just one example case that I'll share. Um, th this patient underwent 36 sonications. Um, the total thermal dose, so that's the uh, region that uh, received over 240 cumulative equivalent minutes at 43 degrees, was about 70 cc's in this case. Uh, and as you can see from the, the multiplanar contrast enhanced T1 Im images I'm showing here, uh, acquired immediately post-treatment, that in this case the number fees volume um, can um, agreed well with the, the placement of the uh, target points, which are those green ellipses, and then also the thermal dose volume, that's the yellow, uh, yellow region. Uh, so that's just one patient. In terms of uh, summary of the, the whole uh, cohort, in terms of some technical parameters, uh, these patients received on average 25 sonications at about 150 watts for 40 seconds. Um, during MR guided focus ultrasound sessions of just over an hour of ultrasound time and just over two hours of MR time. Um, the thermal dose volumes uh, were on average about 25 cc's and that translated to immediate uh, non perfuse volumes of about 80 cc's, although there was, there was quite a bit of variability. Uh, but importantly, there was no off target effects, um, so either in the bowel or spine, for instance, um, or near field uh, skin damage seen in this trial. And then uh, briefly, in terms of the clinical scores, so here on the left, I'm plotting the uh, quality of life increases relative to baseline, and these were shown to increase uh, throughout the year post-treatment. And then on the right is the symptom severity score. Um, so this was shown to improve at one month and was durable throughout the year. So in summary, we've developed a, a 6,144 element MR guided focus ultrasound phase array system. System is fully electronically steerable uh, owing to its half wavelength uh, inner element spacing. Uh, it was made MR compatible. It appears safe and effective for uh, the treatment of uterine fibroids. Um, this system allows large volume tissue ablation without mechanical translation. And its high element count allows for, allows for really controlled energy delivery patterns. Um, and compared to existing devices, its low frequency and active cooling allows for really uh, short dwell times between sonications, which should improve treatment times in the future. Um, and perhaps most excitingly, this technology is uh, modular and scalable, so we're thinking about uh, using it for other indications. Um, I'd like to thank everyone involved with the work, um, our sources of funding, and our um, industry collaborators, Reyes. Thanks. Thank you, Ryan. Next, we have Tao Sun. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for the introduction. So it's a uh, pleasure to be here um, talking about recent work in focus ultrasound, a blood and bear opening uh, for modulation of the um, um, glioblastoma and Alzheimer's uh, environment. We have a particular emphasis on the myeloid compartment of the brain. And uh, I'm going to focus on today's work in uh, the pulse modes of using blood and barrier opening. So uh, we typically use circulating microbubbles and post ultrasound. Um, we have a, a we use typical um, um, uh, pulse length. We use the long 10 millisecond um, pulse lens and um, uh, at the frequency of 690 kilohertz. So. Um, the growing field of blood and barrel opening is pretty well accepted now as a drug delivery tool. So one of the uh, biggest standing questions is, is uh, besides drug delivery, um, what kind of changes are we causing in the cellular profile? And this whole project was uh, initiated uh, when I was doing another project where we, um, where we actually use a, um, a, 
um, we actually I implanted two tumors on each hemisphere of the brain, and we only saw it on one side of the brain, as shown here, uh, in MRI images um, to the left. And um, these mice are received um, the uh, and systematic chemotherapy, and we found that locally, focused ultrasound can enhance T cell infiltration to the GBM. This is quite exciting, uh, exciting because GBM is notoriously very cold um, and in terms of uh, the amount of T cells they have as well as uh, a large number of immunosuppressive myeloid cells in the tumor. And some of the uh, immunologists call it immune desert. And um, what's worse is that the standard care therapies, including uh, steroids injection, um, systematic chemotherapy, uh, radiation will all create an even worse immunosuppressive environment. And that's possibly why, um, starting um, as of last year, um, uh, most of the phase three clinical trials using monoclonal uh, checkpoint blockers uh, therapies failed. So we think focused ultrasound can uh, have speculative roles to improve this therapy. So first of all, it will bring more delivery of the agents, whether it's the antibodies or other kinds of engineered cells. And secondly, it's well accepted that this therapy can actually induce more tumor antigen release, which eventually could have improved this dendritic cell maturation. And thirdly, which will be the focus of this talk, uh, we think it can help traffic, and can help enhance the trafficking and even activation of particular immune factors. So first we did a survival study. We found that indeed the combo therapy, anti-PD-1 blocker plus uh, focus ultrasound, blood and marrow opening can actually bring more survival benefits. Uh, this is uh, conducted in a popular glioblastoma model, uh, GB, uh, GL261. We actually recently have another model, um, which is called 005, and we showed pretty similar results, even though I have to say in the new model, there's no long-term survivors. And um, in a follow-up uh, flow cytometry study, we found to the left, um, indeed, there's more uh, T cell infiltration, which is only can, uh, perf uh, achieved by the combo therapy. And to our surprise at the time, and I'm showing here to the right, uh, there were actually more inflammatory, um, which um, roughly we uh, call it M1 phenotype of the myeloid uh, tumor associated macrophages can be polarized. This is quite exciting, and considering there are more M2 like um, protective. Um, phenotypes of the myeloid cells, uh, tumor associated microphages. So to further validate the uh, trafficking, we uh, put a cranial window on the top of the brain, and then we conducted a uh, multi-photon microscopy to visualize the cell trafficking. As shown here, the green dots are actually labeled uh, splenocytes, which are immune cells collected from the spleen. And then we found after uh, one day of blood and barrel opening, um, we actually uh, achieved a significant amount of trafficking locally to the tumor. And you might have the question of where they exactly are. So we did a follow-up uh, profiling, and we found uh, focused ultrasound enhances the CD8 killer T cells as well as the dendritic cells, um, which is uh, quite, uh, quite supportive uh, for the T cell access. And then in terms of the myeloid cells, which are we are profiling the microglia versus the microphages. And um, in the field, uh, we are always uh, very excited about the microglia activation. But here, we actually found uh, focused ultrasound enhances the antigen presentation behaviors through the microphages rather than the microglia. And this actually echoes what we found before recently. Um, we published this last year. Um, so the well-accepted knowledge in this field is the focus ultrasound may clear the plaques um, through possibly the direct activation of microglia. However, in our study, uh, we do see microglia activation, but um, between um, antibody alone versus antibody plus ultrasound, we do not find further activation uh, through a focused ultrasound. And rather, we think it is because uh, focused ultrasound affects the infiltration 
of monocytes. And then those peripheral monocyte-derived macrophages may have some sort of effects. And um, this ex actually echoes uh, back to our GBM data where we actually use the uh, exact same parameters of ultrasound. We do find um, through MHC1, MHC2 plus the molecules, the overexpression of those molecules are only found in tumor associated macrophages, uh, but not on microglia. So this brings um, a lot of new opportunities and, and I'm plugging my own advertisement this year again. So I'm moving to Northeastern as an assistant professor starting from January and um, uh, we do have actively um, a lot of openings from the graduate students to postdoc level. So if you are interested, your friends are interested, feel free to contact me. And with that, I would like to uh, acknowledge uh, the funding support, especially Focus Ultrasound Foundation, which supports the initial part of this study, and my three mentors. Thank you. Thank you, Tao. Next, we have Aisha Jamil. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Aisha Jamil. I'm a clinical research fellow at Imperial College London. I'm presenting a talk on the evolution of VIM targeting, an international perspective from 2019 to 2021. The ventral intermediate nucleus of the thalamus is the premier site for MR guided focused ultrasound thalamotomy in the treatment of tremor. We actually conceived this study in a similar meeting like this in 2019 in Barcelona. We noted that many centres were presenting their VIM ablation work, but they were targeting the VIM slightly differently, and there was a lack of homogeneity in the way that people were targeting VIM. So we wanted to explore this further. The FUS Foundation kindly sponsored this study with their Global Summer Scholarship, who joined us last summer, Senna Atkin. The study aims to assess the various VIM targeting approaches used internationally, and to consider any trends between 2019 and 2021. We contacted all 39 centres in the Insight Tech database who performed tremor work, and we asked them to share their VIM targeting approach. Results were analysed with particular regard to their primary targeting method, any anatomical landmarks used, and the use of tractography. All centres' VIM targeting approaches were mapped in relation to the mid-commissural point, the MCP. They were mapped graphically and on a 3D model of the thalamus that was based on the Shatterburn Warren Atlas. In total, 30 centres participated in the study. For both years, the primary method of targeting was predominantly anatomical, with over 95% of centres using this method, and actually only one centre using tractography as their primary method of targeting the VIM. In the anterior-posterior plane, the AP coordinates range from minus 3.5 to minus 7.9, posterior to the MCP. And in the medial lateral plane, coordinates range from 11.1 .1 to 18.6 millimetres lateral to the MCP. These are mapped graphically here in relation to the MCP. This is an axial view, and the blue data is 2019, the red is 2021. Across the study period, there wasn't really any shift in the distribution in the AP and medial lateral planes. In the superior and inferior plane, coordinates range from zero at the level of the MCP to two millimetres above the MCP. However, there was a notable shift so in 2019, only 16% of centres were targeting the VIN at, the, at two millimetres above the MCP. But this more than doubled, and in 2021, there was over 40% of centres now targeting the VIN two millimetres above. You can see this in the sagittal graph, blue 2019 and red 2021. This is a 3D model of the thalamus that we created from the Shatterburn Warren Atlas, with key nuclei delineated. This is based on Brain 77 from the Atlas, axial plates 53 to 55. You can see the VIM demonstrated in dark green, the VOP in dark grey, and the VC, the ventral caudalis, in light grey. If you look at the way the VIM is structured, you can see that it tapers inferiorly. So there's actually more tissue in the VIM as you come more superiorly. 
Here are the results from 2019 mapped onto the model. To the left, to the left of the screen, there is the sagittal view, and to the right of the screen, the axial view. So you can see the distribution in all three planes. Imperial center is marked in green. We've always targeted slightly anteriorly. So we're closer to the MCP, which is de demonstrated in black. We've targeted anteriorly because we want to avoid paresthesias that often happen when you encroach onto the ventral cordalis. And here is the 2021 results. You can see that imperial center, again marked in green, has moved superiorly to the two millimeter mark. And there are many centers that have also moved up. And here are the results for both years. We found in 2019, approximately 30% of centres were using tractography in some form during their methodology, but this more than doubled, well actually it doubled exactly, to 60% of centres in 2021. We found that many centres were now incorporating tractography as an aid or an adjunct to their anatomical targeting. So why is this superior trend occurring? Well, we know that this has happened internationally and independently of each other, so we can presume that centres are getting better results. All centres are tailing their treatments to patient response on the table, and so we can presume that they're getting better tremor suppression and or fewer clinical adverse effects. But I can only speak in detail of Imperial's experience. We perform a double lesion thalamotomy. We target the VIM two millimetres above the mid point. We do this to achieve distal tremor control, so that's with your hand out in front of you. We then move down inferiorly to the PSA, the posterior subthalamic area, and we target the central or the postural tremor, which is when your hand is here. This is really important for drinking, um, and so it really affects patients' activities of daily living. The several limitations of the study, which are more expanded on the 10-minute pre-recorded talk, but one thing to note is that the mapping of the 3D model is based on one brain. This is from the Shasta and Warren Atlas, Brain 77. It was a female brain of 40 years old. The distribution of the center's targets in relation to the VIM and the um, adjacent structures, the VIM VC, is very specific for this patient's brain. So it'd be ideal for us to model on multiple brains as everyone's neuroanatomy is different. We'd also like to correlate the targets with the um, tremor suppression outcomes and the adverse effects, and also confirm the target locations on imaging. We have started a 7 Tesla MRI study, which is one of the other pre-recorded talks from our group. And on 7 Tesla imaging, you can actually delineate the VIM directly with direct visualization to conform, confirm our anatomical method. We're going to further expand the study and look into more detail on tractography with an evolution of tractography study. So in conclusion, the vast majority of centers are using anatomical targeting for the VIM, but they're adopting tractography to aid this targeting more and more. We've noted a no, uh, superior trend to target the VIM at two millimeters above the ACPC line. This has happened internationally and independently of each other. And this study shows that collaboration within the FUS community is really quite a fantastic thing. I'd like to thank everyone from our Imperial um, Focus Ultrasound Group and all of the centers who participated who are listed here, the Focus Ultrasound Foundation for their Global Summer Scholarship Scheme and Insight Tech for their database. Thank you. Aisha. Next, we've got Veronica Purr. Yeah, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Veronika Purra, and I'm uh, from the University Hospital uh, in Bonn, in Germany. And I want to cover uh, the possibility of quantitative and qualitative tremor evaluation uh, after MRI-guided focused ultrasound telemetry in patients with essential tremor. I have no disclosures. Um, Bonn was the first uh, German center um, that um, uh, started treatment with the uh, exaplet neurosystem for uh, severe medication refractory uh, tremor syndromes. And since we started in 2018, uh, we treated 63 patients with essential tremor, 29 with Parkinson's tremor, and one patient with uh, spinal cerebellar ataxia type 12 with unilateral uh, thalamotomy. Uh, in 2020, we started uh, measuring the tremor outcome not only clinically, uh, but also um, quantitatively uh, using accelerometry. 
uh, recordings were obtained prior to treatment as well as one to three days after and uh, one year after treatment. And the treatment uh, was performed following the established uh, treatment protocol using standard stereotactic coordinates as well as tractography of the cerebellothalamic tract. On the right side, you can see the demographical uh, characteristics of uh, our ET patient, uh, 17 patient, um, were um, included in the analysis. Um, for clinical assessment, we used a common uh, clinical rating scale of TRAMER, which consists of three parts. Part A uh, includes a clinical rating of different uh, body parts, part B, uh, several motor tasks, and uh, part C, a subjective disability uh, rating. For quantitative uh, measurements, we used the somnolwatch, watch, a triaxial accelerometer, which was placed uh, on each side on the proximal uh, one-third of the meter corpus and recordings were obtained in rest condition as well as in postural condition with and without weight loading for 30 seconds each and a kinetic movement for 15 uh, seconds. Here's an example of a, a single ET patient. Um, a shows um, trimmed time series of uh, the tremor and in B you can see uh, the tremor peak power and here in C you see, uh, in C you see the standard um, spectral analysis uh, which we conducted for each patient and uh, as you can see uh, for the treated extremity we uh, got a reduction in the power spectra after the treatment, um, not for the untreated extremity. Um, tremor frequencies uh, were conducted in each condition if uh, tremor was visible and we got a tremor uh, ranging from 2 to 8 hertz um, in the condition. Uh, qualitative and quantitative uh, tremor ratings uh, revealed a significant decrease after the treatment uh, in a treated uh, extremity, but not in the untreated extremity. And um, as you can see here, the um, tremor of the patients was mostly symmetric and uh, most evident in the postural and kinetic condition. And the decrease was significant in the clinical rating as well as the accelerometric rating uh, measured by the tremor intensity. Um, the correlation of the clinical rating and the accelerometric rating uh, were significant in the treated uh, extremity prior to the treatment and in the untreated extremity after the treatment. There was no significance in the treated extremity afterwards, um, probably because of the low expression of the tremor. Um, to summarize, to our knowledge, this was the first time uh, using a quantitative measurement to evaluate the tremor af outcome after MRI-guided focused ultrasound, and uh, we were able to find a high correlation with the standard clinical rating scale. So uh, we think that devices or wearables uh, can provide a fast and feasible um, tool for measuring the tremor outcome um, after MRI-guided focused ultrasound and may help to better characterize and compare the outcomes uh, for tremor patients. So thanks to my team and uh, the FAST Foundation, Verisonics, of course, and uh, to you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Next we have Daniel Dukes. Hi everyone, thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk about our multicenter study for desmoid tumors uh, treated by Emma guided HIFO. Uh, here are my disclosures. So um, desmoid tumors um, are rare musculoskeletal tumors um, and they behave very differently for each patient while there are a different variety of treatment options um, available. Some of the desmoids can be observed some need medication, surgery, um, radiation, ablation has been included into the guidelines recently, and each of these treatment options have a different set of efficacy versus side effects, and you have carefully to evaluate the patients for this. Um, so we looked at safety and efficacy for Emma guided HIFU, and uh, uh, it was a retrospective study with three sites, uh, 10 years data with 105 patients. 
So we looked at efficacy um, by uh, looking for treatments before and after HIFU. We looked at tumor volumes. We looked at response defined by resist and M-resist. Uh, we looked at pain and quality of life, and we, look, uh, we graded the complications according to the Society of Interventional Radiology. So here you can see an uh, example of a desmoid, and you can see um, that uh, in this, in this uh, tumor, um, you have often adjacent uh, um, uh, nerves, tendons, and, uh, and skin. So you cannot treat the whole tumor in, uh, with MR guided HIFU because if you ablate only one of these structures, you have major side effects. So the total tumor volume for, the, for all patients were 114 cc's, but 84 cc's was actually targeted. And out of the targeted tumor volume, 83% was actually ablated, um, which represented 57% of the tumor. Here you see response. On the top row, you see resist, which is the total tumor, um, and m resist, which is based on the viable tumor. And you see at the best response time that most of the uh, total and the viable tumor were at least stable or better. And if you look at the latest response, you see that this is still true for the total tumor, but you see fi uh, a regrowth of 50% of the viable tumor, which often represented uh, the non-targeted tumor, which grows into the ablation cavity. And that's why you can have progression for viable tumor, but still the overall tumor is shrinking, and the progression-free survival was uh, 13 months. So pain went down from six to three, and quality of life improved by both physical health and mental health at six months. And for complication, the complication rate was around 37%. Um, 80% were mild and moderate, and 20% were severe. And you can see that most commonly you, uh, we saw skin burns. And um, by starting to drop ice water into the bath of the um, of the uh, um, transducer where the patient's lying on, um, we could uh, reduce the, the um, uh, incidence of a burn by 46%. And actually recently an active skin cooling device has been introduced, which was not available in our cohort, um, but this potentially reduces the, the um, uh, incidence of a burn even more. And second most common complication were nerve pulses. So um, to summarize, it's impo important to note that um, most of, or like almost all of these patients were treated one time. Um, it is a partial treatment because of these limitations uh, of anatomical reasons. And um, if they got retreatment, they got retreatment because uh, tumors were, had a ma major regrowth or they had um, um, uh, new symptoms. So um, and then, um, it's important to note that uh, I think for these tumors, because they are benign, they, um, they, they, the, the goal is to stabilize them, and uh, at some point, at 30 months, they also t tend to stabilize by themselves. It's important to get tumor control by, um, by ablating them multiple times, um, and therefore what we heard from the previous session, we need um, better reimbursement that we can offer the patient this kind of uh, treatment. So I want to thank everyone involved. Uh, I want to thank the Focus Ultrasound Foundation for their great support um, and my collaborators. It was a huge group effort and, of course, my mentor, Peggy Ganoni. Thank you, Daniel. Next we have Catherine Liu. Hi everyone, my name is Catherine Liu. I'm from Elise Lacano Fago Lab at Columbia University, and I'll be sharing results on the safety and efficacy of single treatment neural navigation guided FUS to induce bulb and barrier opening in Alzheimer's disease patients. The device of our phase one clinical study is a single element FUS transducer with real-time coplanar 2D passive acoustic monitoring with Verisonic system and then brain side neural navigation system for targeting. We deliver microbubble coupled FUS treatment to the right prefrontal cortex with small region shaving and no sedation. Our portable treatment setup can be seen here, along with our FUS parameters. The total procedure time from patient arrival to treatment completion is about 30 minutes. Our study timeline includes a baseline screening, 
visit where MRI, PET, and MSC score are required, followed by treatment day or day zero, where contrast-enhanced MRI is acquired after treatment to confirm BB opening. Three days after treatment, another contrast-enhanced MRI is acquired to confirm closing. And lastly, we have two follow-up PETs around three weeks and three months after treatment to monitor amyloid changes. Here are some example images with patients before treatment, after treatment, another patient after treatment with region of shaving easily concealed with styling, especially for females. Our primary endpoints include monitoring the total number of individuals with successful BB openings, uh, the total number of related safety events. Our secondary endpoints include finding the percent change in amyloid PET signal intensity and in MSC scores before and after treatment. The study inclusion and exclusion criteria can be are listed here. For more information, please refer to the full online presentation. In total, we enrolled six patients, two males and four females, with a mean age of 70 and diverse race and ethnicities. All subjects' MSC scores one to two months before treatment and three to five months after treatment are listed here, with an average decrease of 2.5 points after 5.5 months. For safety monitoring, the vital signs of all subjects are collected one to two months before treatment, within 30 minutes after treatment, and three days after treatment. Patient three here served as our reference uh, B negative BBO case due to improper microbubble injection that led to no discernible BB opening. And the range of vital signs fluctuations of other subjects are comparable to those of patient three. Physician conducted neurological exam results were normal for all subjects throughout the study, and there was no subject report of adverse events such as headaches, dizziness, nausea, skin burning, and others. Here we display contrast-enhanced T1 images, or CET1, of all subjects after treatment. The highlighted regions of hyperintensity are the sites of BB opening for all subjects except patient three, our negative BBO case. Three days after treatment, we acquired CET1 scans again to confirm closing. Only patient one showed persistent BB opening, and we'll interpret this further in the next slide. Post-FUS MRI safety images we acquired include T2 flare and diffusion-weighted images. On day zero, or day of treatment, we did not observe treatment-related safety adverse events. Three days after treatment, patient one's T2 flare and DWI images showed hyperintensities as highlighted, reflecting mild edema from subarachnoid hemorrhage. We acquired images again 15 days later after treatment for patient one and observed that um, they have gradual edema recovery. After patient one, we adjusted our simulation parameters to control for overestimation of attenuation coefficients from simulation listed at the bottom of this slide. We then proceed to analyze treatment efficacy. First, we quantified all subjects' BB openings uh, volumes except for patient three, who's our um, control uh, negative VBO case. All the other subjects had the openings from 0.3 to 1.2 cc. Then we register all T1 and PET scans to the MNI space, with the BB opening sites after registration highlighted. PET SUVR at baseline, first follow up and second follow up are overlaid on the same MRI images plane. However, it is difficult to qualitatively determine the changes in SUVR, and therefore we continue with a quantitative approach. With our treated site in the right prefrontal cortex, we analyzed percent changes in SUVR and the SUVR asymmetry ratio in the treated side frontal lobe and more holistically, the treated side hemisphere. At the first follow-up, patient two experienced a decrease in the treated, right, uh, treated side frontal lobe SUVR compared to baseline, while patient two and patient four both had decreases in the treated side hemisphere SUVRs. Patient one, two, and six showed decreases in the frontal lobe SUVR asymmetry ratios at the first follow-up compared to baseline, while patients one and two had decreased hemispherical SUVR asymmetry ratios at the same follow-up. In addition, patients one, three, four, and five all had decreases in SUVR or asymmetry ratio at the second follow-up compared to the first follow-up. However, one-way ANOVA analysis test did not show significant decreases. In summary, five out of six subjects had successful openings, with one subject experiencing mild temporary edema. All subjects experienced a decrease in SUVR or SUVR asymmetry ratio in the frontal lobe or hemisphere during at least one follow-up PET. However, the changes were not significant due to small sample size and mild effects from a single treatment. 
Our future work includes uh, SUVR analysis at the sites of EV opening, as well as study continuation expansion to include subject sample to increase subject sample size and to include tau pad scans. I would like to give my acknowledgments to our amazing team of engineers, clinicians, radiologists, and nurses for their valuable contribution to the study, as well as Dr. Elisa Konofagu for her mentorship and leadership. Thank you to the FOSS Foundation and the NIH for funding our study. Please follow our lab's Twitter for research updates. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine. All right, next we've got Arij Nasser. Hello, my name is Arijan Nasser, and I am a second year medical student at Virginia Tech Carilion School of Medicine, and I am working with Dr. Wen Ligon in the non-invasive ultrasound lab. Today I will be presenting on the examination of low-intensity focused ultrasound parameters and longevity of effect for human neuromodulation. So currently, there are multiple non-invasive methods being explored for their neuromodulatory effects, such as transcranial magnetic stimulation and transcranial electrical stimulation. However, they lack life whose high spatial resolution and ability to penetrate deep into the brain. But before we can explore life whose potential for neuro neuromodulatory effects, we must first explore its various parameters. So when a life who burst is delivered, it lasts a certain amount of time, which is our duration. And within each burst are multiple pulses. The amount in which the percent in which the duty site, the Sorry, the percent in which the LIFU signal is on versus off is the duty cycle, and the amount of pulses per second relates to the pulse repetition frequency. For the on portion of the duty cycle, we have multiple cycles that repeat at a fundamental frequency, which relates to the characteristic of the transducer itself, and the magnitude of these cycles relates to the intensity. So just to recap, the main parameters we're able to readily adjust are intensity, duty cycle, pulse repetition frequency, and duration. In terms of current parameters research, we have seen in both small and large animals as well as modeled in previous studies. And in terms of parameters in humans, there was one study looking at specific parameters in four separate experiments, and while they found that a specific duty cycle and durations ended with inhibition of motor evoked potentials, they did not look at the interactions between these parameters, and they did not include intensity as a parameter. So that leads to our gap in knowledge. So based on these previous studies, parameters and their interactions have not been explicitly tested in humans, and we need a precise way to define which parameters are effective before we can translate LIFU as a neuromodulatory tool in the clinic. In this study, we're testing the hypothesis that duty cycles between 10 and 30 percent will cause inhibition, while duty cycles greater than 50 percent will cause excitation, and they will do so while interacting with intensity. We also hypothesize that longer durations of LIFU application will result in longer lasting effects. For our current study design, we're using concurrent and concentric LIFU and TMS application. So you can see on the right in that picture, we have the TMS coil with the LIFU transducer placed under it using a 3D printed attachment. And we use LIFU to stimulate the motor cortex in participants. And we use TMS to stimulate the motor cortex in participants in order to elicit a motor evoked potential of the first dorsal interosseous muscle. For our full parameterization design, we're including three intensities, six duty cycles, three durations, and four pulse repetition frequencies to result in a total of 216 conditions being tested. And our main outcome measure is the MEP amplitude. So for example, in this figure, you can see an MEP trace for a single participant. And for this participant, you can see the modulation of the MEP signal for the 14 different parameter conditions we have. And in this bar graph on the x-axis, you have the different parameters conditions, and the y-axis is the average of the MEP amplitudes per condition. And you can see both inhibition of the signal compared to baseline, as well as facilitation of the MEP signal. For our group data, we have 
for a duty cycle of 70% and a duration of 500 milliseconds and almost 8% facilitation and signal, while a duty cycle of 1% and a duration of 100 millisecond resulted in a 25% inhibition of signal, even though they had the same intensities and the same pulse repetition frequency. So for our future goals, we mainly want to increase the number of participants we have so we can look at that interaction. And once we're able to determine the optimal uh, once we're able to determine the optimal inhibitory and excitatory parameters from the full parameterization design, we'll be able to build on preliminary longevity data that we have. Thank you for your time, and a special thank you to my lab for making this research possible. Thank you, Areej. Next, we've got Sarah Johnson. Good afternoon, I'm Sarah Johnson. I'm a research associate at the University of Utah. And today I'm going to talk about non-contrast MR biomarkers for MR-guided focused ultrasound thermal ablations. Focused ultrasound thermal ablation is a well-suited tool for breast conserving therapies. It poses minimal risk of complications. It can be performed as an outpatient procedure. Uh, and it also can be safely applied using MR guidance uh, with anatomical targeting and real-time thermometry. One of the main advantages of focused ultrasound, it being non-invasive, is also one of the major challenges for translation. Since we don't have uh, tissue resected during treatment, we need an in vivo surrogate for our pathological necrosis. And there are some uh, MR metrics that are already used to gather prediction for necrosis. Uh, most commonly, we have the 240 cumulative equivalent minutes uh, at 43 degrees C metric of cumulative thermal dose, and uh, the contrast-enhanced non-perfuse volume. And as we've heard from speakers and panels across this, this conference, uh, there are some physiological artifacts and transient changes that can really limit the accuracy of these metrics. Um, particularly contrast enhancement acutely after ablation. So this uh, led us to uh, pose the question whether we can determine if a non-contrast enhanced MR biomarker can accurately and acutely predict this thermal ablation volume. And we wanted to employ supervised learning to do this with the histological ground truth label. So we first developed uh, this feasibility study in a, a VX2 tumor model implanted into the muscles of uh, New Zealand white rabbits. And we performed our MR-guided focused ultrasound ablations using our breast-specific system in a 3TMR while collecting uh, 3D thermal dose and thermometry data. We also acquired a 20-minute pre-ablation and PMR protocol that we repeated after ablation. And 40 minutes later, we acquired acute contrast-enhanced imaging. And uh, all of these MR images were longitudinally registered so that we could compare pre and post paint changes. And then three days later, we reacquired images for registration purposes and resected tissue for H&E staining. And uh, a colleague of ours uh, painstakingly uh, completed this impressive feat of registering histology to 3D MRI in vivo. So this gave us our histological label a multi-step process was published in uh, scientific reports, if you're interested to learn more. Uh, we were able to achieve about a one millimeter target registration error with this technique. So our final data set was comprised of the quadriceps from four different subjects. We employed a voxel-wise supervised learning classification. We used a three by three input neighborhood for each voxel for each MPMR feature. And we wanted to look at two different classifiers, a logistic regression and a random forest classifier due to our limited data uh, size and also our small positive class. And through our uh, training, we found that the uh, optimal features for MPMR were the ADC, the T2 weighted imaging, uh, cumulative thermal dose, and maximum temperature projection. So in our validation set, 
Uh, we found that our MPMR classifiers uh, both outperformed the CTD in terms of the area under the receiver operator curve. And we also optimized thresholds for binary classification to maximize dice on our training data. And we did this because it's a harmonic mean of precision and uh, recall. And after doing this on the CTD data, we did see a slight increase in our DICE score using a more optimized threshold than the 240. And this was further improved for both of our uh, MPMR classifiers as well. In addition, compared to the acute NPV, the RFC classifier in particular performed equally or, or better. And that was um, consistent across all of our subjects. And then looking a little more specifically um, at some of our subject-specific data, we can look volumetrically at uh, this representation of the dice coefficient, where the green volume represents the amount of overlap in our segmentations. So um, our optimized CTD prediction, on average, achieved a dice of about 0.44. With, our, with the acute MPV, the dice was considerably improved at 0.68 but we still had a lot of overestimation, and we think this is due to transient um, blockages of perfusion after treatment. And finally, with the uh, RFC classifier, we achieved a dice of point, uh, 0.78 across all animals. So to conclude, uh, an innate contrast MPMR classifier could augment data we already collect with MR thermometry to provide a more accurate and acute biomarker after these thermal ablation procedures. In our case, the random forest classifier was the top performer, and the T2-weighted images and the ADC were the most informative non-thermal features. So in the future, the curation of this data set is, is very challenging, um, but we do hope with simultaneous and quantitative MR imaging, we can build uh, stronger data sets and do some deeper learning, and we also are working towards clinical optimization as well. So I'd like to thank my incredible team at the University of Utah and previous colleagues, specifically Blake Zimmerman, who developed a lot of the registration techniques here, and also the foundation, Verisonics. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Next, we've got Lauren Ruger. Hi everyone, I'm Lauren Ruger. I'm a PhD candidate uh, at Virginia Tech, finishing up in the spring, and I'll be presenting today a little bit of my research investigating histotripsy ablation of spontaneously occurring canine bone tumors uh, in vivo. So I'm sure many people here already know um, a lot of what I'll cover in my background slides, but osteosarcoma are malignant bone tumors that are highly metastatic, and they affect dogs and humans, and osteosarcoma is currently treated with limb amputation or extensive limb salvage surgeries um, in combination with chemotherapy. But despite these advances, there's really poor prognosis specifically for canine patients in veterinary medicine. So histotripsy is a non-invasive and non-thermal focused ultrasound ablation method that uses really short, high amplitude uh, ultrasound pulses to generate acoustic cavitation bubble clouds that expand and collapse to mechanically disintegrate tissue. And there's been a lot of work in the space of histotripsy for uh, soft tissue or soft tissue tumor ablation. And typically histotripsy is guided in real time by ultrasound imaging. And then I'll just get, touch on this very briefly, but a plug for the presentation following this one with my colleague, Dr. Elena Hay, that histotripsy has also been shown to potentially stimulate an anti-tumor immune response. So osteosarcoma, is really a unique challenge for histotripsy. Uh, past research has shown that tissues with higher mechanical strength are more resistant to histotripsy-induced damage. And so the osteosarcoma tumors may be more difficult to treat due to uh, their composition, specifically their heterogeneity. And then it, when you think ultrasound and bone, a lot of people uh, have kind of a gut reaction to, well, that won't work well if you're using uh, ultrasound image guidance. So that might also impact our ability to target. So in this study, uh, we were investigating the in vivo safety, and then we kind of had two patient cohorts. The first patient cohort um, was looking primarily at the safety of histotripsy, and then we were 
We moved on to a second patient cohort where we were trying to more fully characterize the ablative effects of histotripsy for treating osteosarcoma in veterinary patients with spontaneous tumors. Um, so just to briefly give an overview of our methods, the patients were enrolled based on predefined enrollment criteria and received pretreatment CT images for staging and treatment planning. On the day of treatment, patients were anesthetized and the hair overlying the uh, tumor was removed using either shaving or nair, uh, so a hair removal cream. After coupling the transducer to the patient tumor, we completed the volumetric automated image guided histotripsy treatment and then post-treatment, uh, about one day after treatment, these patients underwent uh, standard of care limb amputation of the affected limb with the treated tumor and received a post-treatment CT scan. And so overall, we've just really hypothesized, um, and I hope that my data, so everybody agrees after I show my data that it supports this, but the histotripsy can be used as a non-invasive limb sparing and potentially immune stimulating ablation method for the treatment of osteosarcoma. So I'm not going to go into all the specifics of kind of our treatment protocol here uh, for the sake of time, but we treated 15 canine patients, and we treated just in this, these studies a subset of uh, the tumor volumes, so single treatment, and the tumor volumes range from one and a half to three diameter, three centimeters in diameter, and they were spherical volumes, using a custom histotripsy system at a fundamental frequency of 500 kilohertz and a pulse repetition frequency of 500 hertz, and depending on the patient cohort, we use a dosage of either 500 or 1,000 pulses per point. So as I said, we treated 15 dogs, um, and the patient demographics are shown on the screen with a total of 15 tumors, so just one tumor in each dog, with final histological diagnoses of 13 osteosarcoma and two chondrosarcoma. Um, and then these tumors all varied very much in their location or their composition, ranging from very lytic tumors with uh, large soft tissue involvement to tumors that were actually producing more bone. And depending on the composition of the tumor, it really impacted our visibility of whether or not we could see the histotripsy bubble cloud as shown in the bottom panel of the uh, figure on your right. Um, <laughs> and, but regardless, we were able to confirm generation of cavitation bubble clouds in all patients using ultrasound imaging or a method of passive cavitation detection. So here's just a couple of videos, exa video examples um, of patients patient tumors during histotripsy treatment with and without bu bubble cloud visibility. And so, as I said, ultrasound visible bubble clouds were generated in uh, ultrasound, the histotripsy bubble clouds were generated in all of our patients, but were only visible on nine patients. And we saw varying degrees of prefocal skin cavitation on the ultrasound image in 12 of the dogs. But in our 500 pulses per point cohort, we were able to show for the first time, uh, this is just five patients that underwent this treatment regime, Effective cell ablation for all samples um, and ablation zones in tumors were not super clearly visualized on CT imaging. So overall, there was a replacement with of the untreated kind of intact tumor cells with increased lytic and coagulative uh, necrosis as well as a lot of hemorrhage, but there were still regions of intact cells um, observed in regions of the tumor. So we upped the dose in the remaining 10 patients to 1,000 pulses per point and again, the histology showed effective cell ablation, or effective ablation for samples of all, comp uh, all compositions that I covered a couple slides ago with increased cell death and matrix degeneration observed at, at 1,000 pulses per point. And notably, I'd like to point out that we have not yet optimized this dose. We started this study with an excised uh, study where we weren't as limited by kind of the patient anesthesia time and used a dosage of 4,000 pulses per point where we saw complete ablation of both the cells and the matrix within the treated osteosarcoma tumors. And there is a slide in my recorded presentation showing that data if you're interested. So kind of just conclusions in future work. Um, there's a lot of work left to do, but I believe that these results demonstrate histotripsy's ability to ablate primary bone tumors in vivo. And we did achieve effective tumor ablation in osteosarcoma tumors of varied composition, although further dosing studies are needed. But there are significant challenges um, remaining to accurately monitor the cavitation bubble cloud location and extent during these bone tumor treatments. So future and ongoing work, um, ongoing studies are investigating the immunological effects following histotripsy at various time points for this. Um, again, would like to plug Elena Hayes' presentation. 
but then really we're kind of moving into asking the questions about what device work needs to come next here. So future studies are planned to investigate histogypsy ablation of complete osteosarcoma tumors and to optimize pretreatment pre planning and post-treatment and assess assessment protocols, including replacing those CT images with MRI to get a better idea of the achieved ablation. So a huge shout out to everybody on the slide, um, specifically Kelsey Timby and the Focus Ultrasound Foundation for all of the support that they've provided our various veterinary projects, and thanks for listening. Thank you, Lauren. And last but not least, we have Elena Hay. Hi, I'm Elena Hay. I'm a postdoc at the Virginia Tech uh, Animal Cancer Care and Research Center. And as Lauren just mentioned, I am following up um, on her work and covering the immunological um, outcomes of histotripsy ablation and osteosarcoma. So canine and human osteosarcoma share numerous similarities, and this allows the dog to serve as a valuable comparative oncology model. So for the uh, of these similarities include the need for surgical resection of the primary tumor via limb amputation and limb salvage surgery, or limb salvage surgery. And unfortunately, this disease is mostly highly metastatic, and this is ultimately typically the cause of death in these patients. Uh, this is particularly devastating for human osteosarcoma patients as they tend to be children and adolescents. So this is, demonstrates the profound need for a novel treatment option for osteosarcoma patients uh, that targets both the primary tumor and also demonstrates potential to stimulate the immune response to help with metastatic disease. So therefore, the goal of this study was to investigate the immunological outcomes of histotripsy, ablation, and osteosarcoma. So Lauren kind of just covered this, but to briefly summarize, we enrolled canine patients suspected to have osteosarcoma into our, our study. Um, they had no evidence of metastatic disease at the time of enrollment, and then their tumors were partially ablated with histotripsy. And then one, three, or five days post-treatment, they underwent standard of care limb amputation surgery, and two weeks later, they returned for a follow-up exam. At these mentioned time points, we collected blood samples for immune evaluation, and then uh, tumor samples were collected at the time of surgery. Uh, on treated and treated regions for immune evaluation. So Lauren covered the treatment uh, outcomes and then the patient demographics. So moving on to the immune evaluation, um, for we wanted to assess gene expression changes in these paired uh, untreated and treated regions of the tumor. To do this, we used canine-specific uh, cancer immunity and inflammation crosstalk arrays. And at one day post-treatment, we found that of the 90 evaluated genes, 28 were upregulated threefold or greater or less than threefold. And these genes were associated with immune response and inflammatory response most strongly, and then also response to stimulus and cytokine receptor activity. So this was pretty exciting. Um, at this one day post-treatment time point, it indicated that we uh, induced immune modulation in the treated regions of the tumor. To further look at this, we used a flow cytometry to try to characterize the immune cell populations within the treated and untreated regions of the tumor. And we didn't find on a group basis any significant differences, um, especially with our CD4 and CD8 T cells. However, uh, you can see in graphs C and D, in the, on a patient-by-patient -patient basis, we saw that either the patients had a greater population of CD8 or CD4 T cells, but not both. So this demonstrates the patient-dependent response uh, and the heterogeneous nature of these tumors. Uh, for macrophages, we saw a modest increase in the treated tumors compared to untreated regions of the tumors at this one-day post-treatment time point. So we also looked at the systemic immune response um, and we found that there is a significantly greater population of pro-inflammatory CD80 positive monocytes at uh, 24 hours, one day post-treatment compared to healthy control dogs. And then at this, in this group, at two weeks post-surgery, this trend continued. 
And while it wasn't significant, this population was also greater uh, when compared to pretreatment. For our circulating T-cell populations, we didn't observe any group uh, differences. Uh, we observed a modest increase in CD8 positive uh, T-cells. So this concludes our, our work right now. Um, we have, it's exciting that we have indicated that histotripsy likely modulates the local tumor environment and potentially the stomach and uh, immune response and osteosarcoma, but we have a lot of work that we need to continue to do. And to do this, we're continuing to enroll into our canine clinical trials and evaluate at three and five days post-treatment. And then also we have marine uh, osteosarcoma orthotopic model studies and in vitro studies. And we're doing all this work to hopefully, potentially uh, advance the clinical translation of Osteosar of hysterotripsy for osteosarcoma ablation for canine and human patients alike. So this work uh, has taken a tremendous amount of effort by a lot of people, um, but in the interest of time, I'd just like to say a special thank you to the Focus Ultrasound Foundation for funding support and also to all the canine patients and their dedicated owners. <laughs>